good to see all of you here this morning. There are so many things going on. I'm glad Vince could announce all of those things. So you're going to be busy every weekend for a while, it looks like. There's going to be lots of things that are happening here. Uh, the one that he didn't mention was the uh, cards that we've gotten. Because of the gifts to the schools and things like that, we have been getting... First, we got a couple emails, and then I think we've gotten a total of four cards back. And so we left them kind of across from the Welcome Center on a little table in case you want to see what the teachers have written back about your gift. And so you need to see what they're saying as a matter of thanks for the job that they're able to do. Uh, lots of things coming up. Men's breakfast, new meeting, everything's going to be... Uh, Everything's going to be busy, and so there's lots of things that are going on here. Turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 1. And starting in verse 1, he says, Long ago and many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. And he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs." And so I want you to realize what it happens when God begins to speak. We sometimes look at how God speaks as we look at Genesis. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Or God said, I think I'll have some light now. That's kind of a more modern translation, I guess. And of course there was light. And so God speaks all of these things. I want world, I want separation, I want animals, I want birds, I want, and so each one of those things he does, but those seem kind of disconnected from us, because when God spoke and he said, let there be light, I didn't get the light for him. And so my question this morning is, is there a time when God speaks into your life? Because I think that's the disconnect. I mean, we carry Bibles, we got them, but that's a book, right? I can't wait for the movie to come out. I mean, that's what you need, right, to really understand what this is all about? Well, they've tried to make several movies that I still don't think we even get close to a concept of what God's really about. So does God really speak into your world? This passage talks about he spoke many times in many ways by the prophets. I guess we're familiar with Ten Commandments and the prophet Moses would have given those and God would have said, here's what I want you to do. Here's the way I want you to behave. And some of the prophets were the typical type of prophet. I think that you would recognize the ones where they would go out and they would maybe stand on the street corner or stand in front of an audience and say, here is the word of God and they would proclaim exactly what God had said to them. And so some of them were that type of prophet with a message from God to be able to say those things. Well, some of them were writing prophets. Isaiah, he's the, the writer. And so he writes his prophecy. Now he might have said it as well, but, but he's kind of the, the writing prophet. And so some of them are miracle prophets. So Elijah and Elisha don't seem to write as many books are more with, you know, here's the miracle that he did. They called fire down from heaven. They made the axe head float. They did all kinds of things. They brought a son back to life. I mean, there's all kinds of miracles that happen because of them as a way of God speaking into that world at that time. He speaks in a lot of different ways. So he sends his prophets and they have the words of God, but they also have the actions of God. And sometimes the prophet is nothing more than a guy who acts out the relationship between God and his people. And so you have Hosea who begins to act out the situation between God and his people, and it's horrible. It's awful. 
can you imagine that he uses a marriage to illustrate? Some of you may understand. Boy, if there's ever an illustration about how two people don't get along, it's God and Israel. Or is it husband and wife? And maybe we can understand some of those things as they have prophets that spoke into their world, not just with words, but also with actions, with miracles, with every different form that God was able to communicate with, to be able to say, I'm here and I want you to believe. And then as the writer of Hebrews says, in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. That's a little bit different. And he's leaving behind all the other ideas of prophets, of somebody else who would come and say, thus saith the Lord. And Jesus comes as the son of God, as God himself born on earth. And he begins to say, I say unto you. You've heard that Moses said, but I say unto you. And so he speaks from the God perspective because he is God. And he speaks into their world. He speaks into our world. And a lot of times what we want to do with all of that is say, well, let's go back and look at Beatitudes. Jesus spoke. Let's look at what he taught. When you need to figure out how to do something, how do you do it? It's not too hard anymore, right? You need to replace your garbage disposal. How do you do that? Well, you get out the instruction sheet. You need to do whatever it is. No, you don't. Turn on your computer, you go to YouTube, and they've got a video on how to do that. If you haven't found that out yet, you can do a whole lot of things through that. You can find out just about anything. What I want to say to you is that Jesus is the live YouTube video of how to be a Christian. That's what he was. Here's what it looks like in real life, in real time, in the real way you're supposed to do this. And that's what he was trying to show to them. So God spoke into their world, not just with words, but also with actions, with emotion, with the way you're able to see how he handles situations, with, you know, the patience that he had, with the anger that he had. He speaks into their world and our world and say, this is what God has to say to you. And so I think God does speak into our world. He's been doing this for a long time. We're able to see times, and we often think of the word that is just written down. But then we're also able to realize who Jesus is. He's the one who created everything. He's the radiance of the glory of God. He's the nature of God in flesh. He upholds by the word of his power. He died on a cross for our purification. He sits at the right hand of God. That's who it is, and he speaks into our world. He speaks into your world, not just you know somebody out there in the news somewhere, but he speaks into your life. As you look at how God does it, he, he speaks from a garden. As you look at the, the Garden of Eden, it includes promises. Those are a message from God. It also includes captivity. That's a message from God. Let me see if you can really understand how upset I am as one nation comes in and completely destroys yours. Do you get the anger of God from that? That's kind of a message that says, you know, I'm a little bit dis. dis- displeased with you. And I want you to realize God speaks into our world and it doesn't matter what it is. Monday nights we're trying to do this Spanish class and I emphasize the trying because see and know and taco and I'm out of words and you know so but it's a different language. God speaks Spanish. Did you know that? Of course, Jesus used to insist that Spanish was the only language God spoke, and angels translated everything else. But uh, So the rest of you should learn Spanish if you want to talk to God in heaven. But he speaks into every different culture that there is. He spoke into the Roman cultures. He speaks Babylonian, Israeli. He speaks American. He even speaks postmodern. Did you know that? He can communicate into that world, into the one that says, yeah, we don't really believe there's a specific truth. I mean, your truth is yours, mine is mine, and we'll all, he understands that. 
And he's able to talk to that. He's able to speak to that. He speaks disobedient prophet when he speaks to Jonah, doesn't he? He understands how to do that. He speaks unworthy prophet when he talks to Isaiah. He speaks scaredness when he talks to Gideon. He speaks lazy and apathetic. Yeah, you don't want to know what he talks about with that. And he wants one thing. He wants you to believe. That's the one thing that he wants. Into every language, he speaks discouragement. He speaks rejection. He speaks into your world. He speaks into our fear, and he says, don't be afraid. He speaks into the experience of human living and the tiredness that you get after having to go all week long, working like crazy, and you finally get a day off on Sunday. And he says, worship? Really? Yeah, he understands that. He speaks into that. He speaks false teacher language. He knows what that's all about. He speaks into a garden where he was betrayed and he had followers and everyone runs away. He understands that kind of loneliness. So what I want you to realize is that Jesus is language. He's the YouTube of our day. And so they ask him, teach us how to pray. Was it that they didn't know how to pray? They knew how to pray. They just didn't know how to pray like that. And when they heard Jesus pray, they said, you know what? We don't have a clue how to pray. And he was speaking into their world. How to teach. How to get the point across. Jesus does all of those things. So does Jesus speak into your world? Does Jesus speak to you? He speaks to different understandings. He speaks to Sadducees who don't even believe in resurrection at all. And he speaks to those people who didn't believe that he was Messiah. He speaks into all kinds of different beliefs and ideas. He talks to the people who don't really get it yet, like Nicodemus. And what you're looking at in the book is all of the communication of God as he tries so many different ways to speak to his people. That it might call them to follow him. And I want you to know today he speaks to you as well. And he has one message. I want you to believe in who God sent. I want you to listen to him. And I want you to follow him. And so he comes down to this earth as the son of God. And he says, I am here to tell you who God is. In John chapter 4, I want to share with you a couple of different passages today that talk about and show how God was speaking into their world. And so as you look at the different things of how he does this, in John chapter 4 and verse 46, it says, So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he, he had made water to wine, and at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. And when his son heard that Jesus had come to Judah, to Galilee, he went to him and they asked him to come down and to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went on his way. And when he was going down, his servant met him and told him that his son was recovering, and he asked him the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, his fever left him. And the father knew it was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. This was the second sign that Jesus had done when he had come to Judea, to Galilee. The guy's in great distress. I don't blame him. I mean, you've got a son that's about to die. That's a horrible thing to have happen to you. Does God have anything to say to us when we're losing loved ones? Is there anything that God would say about that? Or is it just, well, you know, life goes on. No, he does that. The man says, come down to my house. If you come there and touch my son, 
I know that you can do something. I know that you can heal him. And Jesus says, no, I'm not doing that. Seems kind of cruel, doesn't it? His son's about to die and Jesus refuses to go. Yeah, he refuses to go. I am not going to do that for you. He just says, go on, your son will be well. Actually, he says your son won't die. Well, that's good news. He'll just be sick the rest of his life. Do you ever want to argue with God? God, I don't think you're hearing me. I don't think you understand. I don't think you see my situation. And he's speaking into his grief because he's looking for faith. He says, just go, your son will live. And when he gets there, he sees the servant, and the servant says, your son's alive, he's fine. Well, what time? And he realizes it's the, it's the time when Jesus spoke. So he speaks into our distress and into our grief. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up wounds. He understands what that's like. He does that with people. The man believes. Jesus gives him a promise in that distress. What an incredible picture it is. That's the point. It's the point of faith. And that's what he was trying to get from the man, was that idea of faith. It isn't that, you know what, I need my son healed. Okay. And who are you asking? Well, I'm calling to God. God, I need my son healed. And then what? Is it, God, I just want you to do this for me, and then if I ever have another need, I'll call on you again? And He says, no, I want you to realize I speak into that world where grief and disappointment and discouragement and disease is there, and I care. And so you go back not having an answer, other than the fact that I said it'll be okay. And he finds that he's completely healed. From the very time Jesus said the words, you see, it's that concept of faith. And that's when you see the miracles happen. That's when you see some things get worked out. And it doesn't always work out. I don't want you to get that impression that every single time. But Jesus didn't make the son sick. And neither does every son survive. There's been a couple of people that have died in this earth. A lot, in fact. In fact, all of us will. It's not about solving death other than him doing that by resurrection. But he speaks into that world and he says, I want you to know I care and I want you to believe. One of the greatest examples that I know of of faith is the time with Peter. When they're out on the boat and they're rowing, they've had a long, hard day, and they're rowing across. In Matthew 14, 22, he says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it's I, don't be afraid. I'm not sure that really helped. <laughs> it should, shouldn't it? God speaks into your fear, into maybe what's the most horrible thing you can think of. We're about to die. We can't get to shore. He speaks into their failure because these are experienced fishermen. They ought to know how to sail a boat. What are they doing? Having to row now? It doesn't say specifically. You know, what did they do in order to get the boat across? All I know is they're not able to get across, and it's the fourth watch, and the fourth watch is between 3 and 6 a.m. So they've been at this all night. And they're not really able to go anywhere. And Jesus comes walking. Why don't you just jump to the other side? I mean, if you can walk on water, can't you jump across a lake? Right? Maybe it's the landing. No, that doesn't matter. 
he walks on water to let them know, I am coming into your situation. I am coming into your world. And when they start screaming like little girls, he says, it's me, don't be afraid. I think he's trying to communicate something to them by being present in the situation with them. It's not just words that would come out and say, do not be afraid, no fear. You know, God came up with that logo first. He says, tell you what, I'll walk out there with you. And apparently he's doing a better job walking than they are sailing, rowing, whatever they're doing and trying to get across. And so they're looking at this going, wow. But he puts himself in their world, in their distress, in their fear, in their situation. I want you to realize God does that. Please do not ever assume that he's not there with you in those things. And then the next part is just, I'm sure you know the story already, but it's just kind of one of those amazing stories. He said, and Peter answered to him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. And when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and he took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I've always questioned Peter's logic at this point. Because there is no logic to it. If Jesus is looking for faith, he's got it, doesn't he? If he's really looking for faith, looking for a time when someone is going to believe in what he says, I am walking across here, putting myself into your situation, and Peter gets it. He says, I understand. If you're walking out here on the water, why couldn't we? Because you have said, I want you to follow me. I'll follow you now. If it's you, tell me to come. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and he begins walking across and he walks to where Jesus is, at least within reach. And, you know, then he sees how bad the wind is and how bad the waves are. And do you walk uphill on a wave? That was just crash over me. But, I mean, if you have to walk up a wave and you got 10 foot swells, this could be hard work, right? Then he begins to sink. Jesus catches him. Why did you doubt? I always wish they could have finished this one out. You realize what would have happened? Jesus is walking across. He's not headed for the boat. He's headed for the other side. He's there to be there when they go. Well, they see him and they start screaming. And, you know, well, don't be afraid. It's only me. I'll see you on the other side. Peter gets out, goes with him, decides, you know what, I'm going to come too. Come on. And they walk to the other side. How long would it be before the second guy got out of the boat? They've been there all night already. How long would it be before the next guy decided, you know what, if he can walk over, I guess I should walk over? Do we sometimes just wait it out? There's a storm. We've got to just wait it out because obviously nothing's going to happen. Or maybe we really need to take some time and say, here's what we need to do to have faith in God. And there are some radical actions that need to play, take place. And you ask for the invitation, God, would this be okay? And Jesus here says, come on. And Peter gets out to do what nobody can do. And the rest of them, he gets them back to the boat. Because maybe he doesn't know that the rest of them would even get out. And then the storm calms down. But there's none of the, you know, big giant voice of peace be still and the water flattens out. No, not till they get all the way back to the boat. He does not calm the storm while Peter's out there walking. I want you to realize that's what happens. He speaks into your fear. 
And he speaks into your fear by confronting the fear and saying, I don't care how bad the storm is. If you sink the boat, we'll just walk. Right? Can we give God that kind of option? Can we give God that kind of credibility to say, I believe he's powerful enough to do that? Or maybe he's trying to say, your time is up. But that God certainly is able to do anything that God wants to do. God's able to do everything that he believes is possible. What if we didn't doubt? Does Jesus ever speak into your fear? Are you afraid to succeed? No, I mean, are you afraid you'll fail? Which one's right? You're afraid you'll succeed or afraid you'll fail? It's the same fear, isn't it? And the question becomes, are you willing to try? Are you afraid of what people are going to say about you? Are you afraid that you aren't as good as somebody else? These are fishermen who couldn't get a boat across a lake. They're supposed to be experienced in this. We need to let Jesus speak into our fear and watch what he's doing because he seems to show up in the situation with us. And what can we learn from that situation? And the last one I have for you is just also with Peter. I just think this is amazing as he trains his disciples and teaches Peter. As they get close to the time of crucifixion, you see Jesus telling Peter in Luke twenty-two thirty-one, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you even know me. What an incredible thing he's doing for Peter here. He speaks to his failure. He speaks to his sin before it's even happened. You ever had somebody do that? Tell you that, you know, don't do this because this is going to get you into trouble? Sometimes it does. And we just go right ahead and we didn't pay any attention. Satan has demanded, wow, there's a bigger scale of things that's going on here. He says, I prayed not that you would succeed, not that you won't sin. I pray that your faith won't fail. He will fail, but I don't want your faith to fail. Because he's going to deny Jesus, and it's going to be exactly like he said. And there's going to be three times where he gets very upset and, and says, No, I don't even know Jesus. Really. And Jesus believes in Peter still. And he says, When you fail, I still want you back. Strengthen your brothers when you come back. Do you think God would say that to you? That if you've ever sinned in your life, that God still wants you back? That he wants you to behave, that he wants you to get better, and that he knows you're going to fail, and that it's not about the failure, it's about believing in him. And it's about being able to get to that point where you understand and you're able to believe that he is the one that makes all the difference. You don't want that being able to hide and being able to say, well, no, I'm a Christian on Sundays. When you get to work, I mean, it's not you saying it, but you just kind of laugh at all the jokes that go along. Yeah, maybe it's into your fear, maybe it's into your failure, maybe it's into the times where people start accusing you of actually being a Christian and we just don't want to speak up for that. You don't want to say how strong you are. Are you a Christian? Well, I go to church. Not that I believe that I would die without my Christianity. And I don't ever want to be in a place where I don't 
show up at church where I don't worship my God, where I would in any way put anything that would make me look doubtful of him because he speaks into my life. I listen to him in my life. He runs things in my life. He controls my life. Can we say that? That Jesus is the one who does that? Is Jesus speaking to your sin right now? Is he speaking to your fear? Maybe speaking to your confusion. Where you're going, I don't know where I am on all this. I think he speaks into our fear and into our sin and into our discouragement. And he says, you can be saved. You can be forgiven. And I want you to be. And he was willing to go to a cross for us. So that we could be forgiven. And he believes in you. That you are able to do this. Just don't claim to be unique, okay? That's always the excuse, isn't it? Well, you know, they don't understand my situation. I've talked to God and he understands I'm different. That is the biggest con. Are you kidding me? That is Satan at work. Well, I know nobody quite has my circumstance. Do you think Jesus hasn't seen it before? But he's saying some things to you about what you need to do to get your life right. And the question is, are you going to listen? Yeah, he speaks into every sinful culture that there ever was. And he says, I want you to believe in God. And I want you to follow what God has to say about how to get to him. And for our time, that is to repent of your sins, be baptized into Christ, and be able to worship him and do things with him. What an incredible thing it is to realize what God actually wants. And for that to be so crystal clear that you know absolutely that God has spoken into your life, and this is exactly what God wants me to be doing. He does all kinds of things. He speaks into our world. Sometimes he clears the temple, and he throws out all the money. I'd rather him not do that one to me, but that just means I'm going to put myself in a different situation than where they did. I want him to say to me, when you turn back again after your next one, strengthen your brothers. And maybe you're there. And maybe it's time to say, I know what he wants. I know what he said. And I need to come back to him. Are you ready to do that this morning? We're here to help. Come while we stand and sing.